Good morning. I'm Bill Shaw. I'm the director of the Great Plains Laboratory, and I'm pleased to have uh, a guest here today, Carrie Gillum, who's going to be discussing her brand new book, Whitewash. And let's see if we can hold it up here. So the title is Whitewash, and there's some boards here, uh, and the story of a weed killer, cancer, and the corruption of science and a, a, a nice promo by Aaron Brockovich. Whitewash reads like a mystery novel as Gillum skillfully uncovers Monsanto's secretive strategies. And uh, I, I recently read it myself and it's really a very entertaining, uh, excellent uh, piece of uh, journalism and, and uh, I it's funny, I had read another book by a, uh, a woman in the Kansas City area who had just written a book about Churchill. And so uh, I was, I was uh, very appreciative of the fact that we have really two excellent books coming out of Kansas City at the uh, same time. So, uh, Carrie, is this your first book? This is my first book. Yes. Great, yes. great. And so uh, how long ago did you uh, come up with the idea of writing a book about it? So I've been a journalist, you know, for uh -huh. more than 25 years and spent most of my career with Reuters, uh -huh. an international news agency covering food and agriculture and Monsanto uh -huh. and all mm -hmm. the chemicals that we use in farming. Mm -hmm. And a publisher actually came to me while I worked at Reuters and said, we'd love for you to put all this into a book, oh. all the work that you've been doing. Mm -hmm. And I said, who has time to write a book? <laughs> right. um, but I left Reuters at, in late uh, 2015 and went uh -huh. to work for a nonprofit uh -huh. called U.S. Right to Know, uh -huh. and they uh, graciously gave me the time I needed to put the book together. So mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. know, it's out now, October 2017, mm -hmm. by Island Press, and um, I'm hoping people you know read it and learn from it because I think there's some important messages in there. Okay, so. Uh, uh, how did you first learn about the uh, Roundup? <laughs> Roundup weed killer, right? Yes. Everybody's got it. I mean, uh, I used yeah. to have it in my garage. Uh -huh. you know, I would use Roundup in my lawn, in my garden. Yeah. Um, you know, it's sprayed on children's playgrounds and parks and golf courses. And, of mm -hmm. course, farmers around the world mm -hmm. use it in mm -hmm. production of yeah. key food crops and uh -huh. uh, grains for livestock. It's really pervasive. It's been mm -hmm. found in our air and our mm -hmm. water mm -hmm. um, and our food and our mm -hmm. bodies, as mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. very well. So covering Monsanto and food and agriculture, Roundup was a very big part of that. Glyphosate, the mm -hmm. key ingredient in Roundup, was, mm -hmm. was a huge um, business money-making machine for Monsanto and other chemical companies. So I needed to learn everything I could about it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've done for 20 years. That's great. Yeah. So uh, did, you, did you grow up as a farm girl? You know, I did not. My mother was from southeast Kansas. Uh -huh. She was a beauty queen in a small town of about 8,000 people. Uh -huh. And I, from time to time, my family would take me back there. My father relocated us there for a few years. So mm -hmm. I, you know, spent some time on a mm -hmm. hay truck and, you know, mm -hmm. in a dairy farm. But I certainly didn't grow up uh, uh -huh. in agriculture or food or farming. Oh, okay. And... One of the things that I'd really like to know is what's, what's the uh, big deal about Roundup? So you have something you spray on the weeds and the weeds die. Isn't that good for people that, <laughs> that all their weeds die and their, their corn grows tall and well, sure, healthy? Yeah. This was, you know, Monsanto introduced glyphosate key ingredient again in Roundup and other branded herbicides in 1974. Uh, and farmers and other people around the world really embraced it early on uh, because it did kill weeds so effectively mm -hmm. uh, and efficiently and was said to be so much safer than other herbicides out there. You know, farming mm -hmm. is a dangerous business. Mm -hmm. Farmers are exposed to a lot of different pesticides mm -hmm. if they choose to use those mm -hmm. in uh, farming. So glyphosate or Roundup was supposed to be very safe. It worked great. People loved it, and uh, sales took off, especially mm -hmm. when genetically engineered crops designed mm -hmm. to work with Roundup mm -hmm. were introduced. Mm -hmm. um, but 
despite the you know assurances of safety, independent research over the years has started to show you know links to cancer and other diseases. The International Agency for Research on Cancer declared it a probable human carcinogen in 2015. So there are real mounting concerns about not only environmental harm, mm -hmm. but human health harm associated mm -hmm. with this chemical, which is, per again, pervasive you know, mm -hmm. in, our, in our environment and our bodies. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so many people, I think, are, are somewhat confused about the issues with genetically modified foods. They, you know, some people say, well, humans have been modifying foods by... Uh, by selecting seeds sure. since the beginning of uh, civilization. Sure. Matter of fact, civilization is considered the development of farming. That's right. that's the the uh, the event that where people were able to plant foods and mm -hmm. and and then um, they were able to be in groups and stay in in one place rather than roaming the earth like right. before. The advent of farming. Right. So, uh, so is there uh, the fact that something's genetically modified? Uh, uh, why why would that be of concern? Well, you know, this is it's a great question, and the companies like Monsanto and Dupont and others who license, patent, and sell these speci specially uh -huh. genetically altered seeds like to sort of play it both ways. On the one hand, they say, ah, people have been doing this forever, crossbreeding and taking the best traits from certain plants and putting them with others and making healthier germplasm better. Uh, germplasm has been going on forever, which it has. But on the other hand, these companies patent these seeds because they are so unique and so different and have never before, you know, been <laughs> developed and released into the world. Uh -huh. These are not things that can occur naturally. Mm -hmm. These are crops where the companies have taken DNA from other species outside the, the plant species and mm -hmm. introduced that mm -hmm. DNA into mm -hmm. the DNA of the corn or the mm -hmm. soy. So it's a transgenic, a transgene, something mm -hmm. that doesn't occur naturally in Mother Nature and never has, and that's uh -huh. why these companies patent and mm -hmm. are able to patent these mm -hmm. life forms, essentially. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to say it's been going on for hundreds of years, no, that's not true, it hasn't. Not, mm -hmm. not what we're seeing with genetically engineered crops. Mm -hmm. It's a good line to try to make people mm -hmm. feel better, <laughs> but it's not true. Um, I, I want to ask about the uh, people who are doing research on toxic effects. Isn't it true that most of these toxic effects are not related to the uh, DNA been altered, they're, they're due to the pesticide that's applied to these GMO plants, isn't that correct? Well, there have been different studies, yeah. I mean, people have been looking at both the, the seeds or the crops themselves and yeah. trying to determine, you know, safety issues mm -hmm. there and looking at Roundup or glyphosate applied to the crops. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there have been a number of studies um, that have shown harm with both. Um, but the Roundup and the glyphosate is really the key concern, at least for me and with a number of scientists, that mm -hmm. it's being sprayed directly on not only genetically modified crops, but also a number of other crops like wheat and oats and, mm -hmm. and barley and lentils and things. Uh, and the residues are showing up in our food, in mm -hmm. baby food, baby oatmeal, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, all sorts of things. So that's, you know, that's the biggest concern that I have. Um, I know a lot of people are concerned the genetically altered crops um, can, you know, lead to allergenicity issues, uh -huh. unexpected, you know, problems in that regard. But my concern is really with the pesticides. Mm -hmm. So, how many different genetically modified plants uh, exist in the world today, and are, are, are they all products of Monsanto, or have yeah. other companies gotten into the? Other companies. Uh, genetically modified plants as well. Yes, yes. Now we have, you know, we have the, the apple now and uh, we have a papaya, uh, a squash, but the bulk of the crops, the row crops, the, the bulk of the genetically engineered crops planted in the world today uh -huh. are soybeans and corn and cotton. Mm -hmm. Those were released by Monsanto, developed, licensed. There are other companies that have genetically altered traits as well, but Monsanto is sort of the big dog. Uh -huh. in this game. Uh, and as far as a number of crops that may have lost track, uh, there's sugar beets, alfalfa, um, as I said, 
soybeans, corn, mm -hmm. um, no wheat. People seem to think that wheat is genetically altered. Monsanto tried to introduce a Roundup Ready genetically mm -hmm. altered wheat mm -hmm. about well, going on almost 20 years ago now. Mm -hmm. Farmers didn't want it, industry didn't want it, export markets didn't want it, and they ultimately had to shelve it in 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means wheat is completely free of, no, uh, of uh, <laughs> Roundup and glyphosate, no, right? No, wheat is sprayed directly with um, Roundup shortly before harvest in a lot of geographies. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a brilliant idea that Monsanto um, had to encourage farmers to spray this weed killer directly on, as I said, oats or wheat or barley, mm -hmm. uh, to dry out the crop, to desiccate mm -hmm. the crop, mm -hmm. uh, so that farmers could harvest their fields more consistently and efficiently. And what we're seeing is really high levels of residues in the food products that come from those crops. So before Roundup came out, how did farmers uh, harvest their wheat? <laughs> they just managed to do it the good old-fashioned way, I think. You know, did let, they have to do it twice? Let they, Mother Nature ripen it, and then you harvest it. So they had to sometimes wait longer to I think, to uh, harvest the wheat in order that all of it had matured and or perhaps uh, died. you do right, or you do different sections at different times. But you know, farmers are really a slave to Mother Nature and. Mm -hmm. temperatures and moisture and mm -hmm. uh, you know wind and all of that sort of thing play mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. um, but it seems like we don't we don't try to work with mother nature quite as much as we used to uh -huh. <laughs> we rely on these pesticides for shortcuts uh -huh. and that's where in a lot of the problems lie yeah so uh, w what is the predominant uh, herbicide in in the world today well right now it's glyphosate uh -huh. yeah. like you have an idea, like what percentage that uh, of total wheat killer might be done? We, you know, just hazard a guess. I don't. I really don't. Uh -huh. um, it you know, atrazine is is sort of the next one out there, which is uh -huh. uh, Monsanto sort of trumped when they brought glyphosate out. There are a number of other weed killers that are used still today, but glyphosate, because of its effectiveness and efficiency, has been the dominant you know player. And now mm -hmm. what we're seeing is companies um, mixing glyphosate or combining it with dicamba, mm -hmm. combining it with 2,4-D, other mm -hmm. herbicides. So mm -hmm. even when the other herbicides are used, a lot mm -hmm. of times they're used in combination with mm -hmm. glyphosate. So it's, it's still the kingpin, um, although it's not working quite as well and farmers are really mm -hmm. struggling to try to figure out what to do. Uh, give me an idea of the timeline of the uh, the invention of glyphosate and 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 how it got into the uh, into agriculture in the United States and then uh, spread to uh, other countries. Sure, sure. And actually, I mean, it it spread to other countries pretty quickly um, for different uses. But as I said, Monsanto introduced it uh, to the marketplace in 1974. And it was embraced rather rapidly in a number of countries around the world mm -hmm. as, again, a safe mm -hmm. and efficient mm -hmm. uh, way to kill weeds. It was used by utility companies. Sort of one of the first uses was uh, more industrial use, was mm -hmm. to kill weeds along roadways and mm -hmm. um, municipal-owned um, properties. Uh, but it very quickly became a favorite for farmers. Uh, Monsanto's patent on this chemical was expiring in the year 2000, mm -hmm. and coincidentally or not, um, they came up with these crops that could be sprayed directly with glyphosate mm -hmm. or Roundup, mm -hmm. and they introduced those in the mid 1990s. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and it was designed as a strategy to keep their hold, to keep their control of the herbicide market, mm -hmm. of this very you know, mm -hmm. profitable herbicide. Mm -hmm. And farmers at the time loved it. Roundup mm -hmm. ready soybeans, plant your soybeans, spray them directly with Roundup, your whole field. Uh -huh. Weeds die, soybeans don't. Mm -hmm. Greatest thing ever. Mm -hmm. right? Farmers mm -hmm. could take a second job or go on vacation or <laughs> uh -huh. not worry about things and they thought it was a really good deal. But yeah. you know, then the problem started. and. The human health concerns and the weed resistance and the soil degradation and the biodiversity losses and mm -hmm. um, you know it's turning out not to be the good thing everybody thought that it was. So have uh, have any countries in the world outright 
uh, ban the use of glyphosate in their countries? Yeah, there are different countries that have. There are smaller countries. The larger ones, uh, like Argentina, that took a look at doing that, got a real political pushback. Uh, Europe, there are many countries in Europe that are looking to or trying to limit or ban glyphosate right now. France just recently said they wanted to ban it within five years. They wanted to, you know, roll back all uses uh, and try to phase that out. And Europe, you know, could conceivably ban it completely mm -hmm. uh, just within the next few months. They're, mm -hmm. they're looking at whether or not to reauthorize it or keep it on the market. And it's a very hot debate with a lot of countries very concerned about the safety of this chemical. Mm -hmm. I, I had read a, a scientific study from Sri Lanka, right. and in that country there were large numbers of deaths that were implicated from the possible use of glyphosate on the crops. Uh, Sri Lanka was a country that had used this as their primary agricultural chemical, so the sales of glyphosate exceeded almost all the sales of all the other agricultural chemicals uh, combined, and yet they were seeing, I believe the figure was 15% of the population had this unusual kidney, kidney disease, disease that was not due to the usual causes like diabetes right. or, or, um, or uh, high blood pressure. Instead, right. uh, what they found is that many of the people were in areas where they had what they call hard water, water that contained high amounts of, of um, minerals. And some of the minerals were safe minerals like magnesium and calcium, but some of the minerals were toxic like arsenic. Mm -hmm. And the theory was that it was the chelating properties of glyphosate that was right. bringing these toxic metals into the body and, and uh, causing the kidney disease and, and, uh, and a very large number of, de of deaths. Yeah. No, you did a great job of explaining, I think better than my chapter in my book. That's a much better way of explaining it. But that's true. And, you know, there was a, a scientist there who really demonstrated that um, through extended research and raised the alarm bells about that. Uh -huh. uh, but you're right. I mean, kidney, this, that particular kidney disease is just one sort of element of concern that people are having. You know, non-Hodgkin lymphoma mm -hmm. is another. Um, there are concerns about it being an endocrine disruptor uh -huh. and having developmental problems, birth defect issues. Uh -huh. There uh -huh. are a number of farmers in Argentina who have yeah. sued Monsanto, saying their children have birth defects because of their, you know, their mm -hmm. or their wives' exposure. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of concerns mm -hmm. about this. So um, the... In, uh, in Sri Lanka, they, they, my understanding is now there's a complete ban mm -hmm. of, uh, of uh, glyphosate. My understanding and, as well, yes. And, and so, so what are they doing to replace it? <laughs> you know, I don't know. Uh -huh. I haven't been able to venture over to Sri Lanka. <laughs> you know, I mean, farmers were killing weeds well before, you know, yeah. 1974 and, yeah. and the introduction of glyphosate. Yeah. Uh, so... You know, there, there are ways to handle weeds, and, you know, people do that in organic farming, and a number of farmers now who even aren't organic but are just trying to, you know, replenish the health of their soil mm -hmm. um, are rotating crops more, um, mm -hmm. you know, using what they call cover crops, mm -hmm. and, and just being more protective, protective and caretaking of their fields mm -hmm. in ways that limit and suppress weed development. Uh -huh. um. So, uh, what did what did people do to control weeds uh, before the advent of these uh, large right. chemical companies providing right. uh, herbicides? Well, as I said, crop rotation was a big deal. There, there are a lot of things that are beneficial to the soil and to the field and to keeping weeds at bay involved in sort of changing up the kinds yeah. of things that yeah. you're planting yeah. in the field. Yeah. Um, there are also... So what, what, so what are some of the uh, common well, they uh, would crops often, that are rotated? They would often uh, rotate wheat, you know, uh -huh. with corn or wheat with soybeans uh -huh. or, um, you know, small other small grains. Mm -hmm. um, 
that sort of thing, or clover, um, uh -huh. for instance. Yeah. Things that maybe aren't quite as uh, profitable yeah. for farmers, yeah. but it kept the fields healthier. Uh -huh. They also you know, tilled the ground quite mm -hmm. a bit. I mean, you had tillage, mm -hmm. churning up the soil, yeah. you know, basically getting the weeds out yeah. of there and killing off the weeds that way, which it wasn't a good thing either uh -huh. in a lot of situations. Uh -huh. um, because you have erosion and, and runoff. And, uh, so there, you know, farmers have a lot of challenges mm -hmm. and they're looking for strategies. Mm -hmm. There is a push right now by the USDA, uh, although it's a very sort of quiet push, uh, to educate farmers about these alternative practices mm -hmm. to try to discourage this aggressive use of synthetic chemicals mm -hmm. and pesticides mm -hmm. because it's doing so much damage. Mm -hmm. So you do have little armies of uh, USDA, you know, conservation experts who are meeting with farmers and trying to teach them these age-old practices and mm -hmm. trying to encourage them to, you know, mm -hmm. bring these back. And you also have a number of food companies. You know, Ben and Jerry's was just sort of in the news, but a number of food companies who are realizing consumers are realizing we're getting pesticides in our foods, mm -hmm. and they're pushing back on farmers. Mm -hmm. You know to figure out alternative methods mm -hmm. because it's just not a good thing as you know in your business here to be loading up our <laughs> our diet with all of these dangerous pesticides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so one of the things that's been fascinating to me is to see that uh, in individuals in which we measure glyphosate Individuals with very high values are never healthy. Yeah. The, the people who have the highest amount of glyphosate are among the sickest people that we find. We have not found high glyphosate in any person who I would say is in good health. Mm. Uh, and virtually everyone has uh, small amounts of glyphosate. By the way, did you ever I, do that? Do that I test? dropped off my sample today. Oh, 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 so. Okay, okay. So I can't ask that question. You'll have to let me. Well, <laughs> I I had my urine tested uh, a few months ago and did have. I can't remember the value, but did have a you detectable a quantity. detectable yeah. amount. Um, yeah. Which is worrisome. Yeah. It's all worrisome, though. I mean, glyphosate's only one, obviously, mm -hmm. pesticide that shows mm -hmm. up in our diet. Yeah. So that's a great concern to me. I'm interested in your work, uh, you know, when we've talked about this, primarily because I'm, I'm mystified by why there isn't more of it, why we aren't doing aggressive biomonitoring, and why mm -hmm. our physicians aren't routinely, you know, running our blood and urine and through laboratories like yours yeah. to, to see if the, we are, have heavy loads of yeah. you know, metals and chemicals and pesticides in our bodies. And yeah. It seems like we'd rather pop a pill yeah. than look inside ourselves to see what might be causing our problems. Yeah, you know? yeah. and since we've offered the testing, I, I didn't know where it was going. And when it took about six years to develop a, a toxic chemical screen that would check for many of the most common uh, herbicides, pesticides, industrial chemicals mm -hmm. in the environment. And, and one of the thought was, what after the six years of work that nobody has abnormal values? Well, that was not a problem at all. <laughs> oh, so we, we find an extremely high number of illnesses are associated with toxic chemical exposure. When, and when the chemicals are removed by by agents that like uh, glutathione that bind to toxic chemicals, or when, um, uh, or when the person uses a frequent sauna treatments where the heat helps the body to release oh. the toxic chemicals out in the sweat, there, there's a marked improvement in, in almost every illness. Just a sauna. Just a sauna. Just so, a sauna. so folks Gosh. that. Um, you know, you might want to uh, consider getting a sauna. They're not, they're not real uh, yeah. expensive, and if you've got space in your garage or your basement, uh, it's a great way to yeah. get rid of toxic chemicals. So do you see, here I'm flipping, asking you the questions, but do you see a change or a movement forward to more laboratories and more integrative medicine? Uh, more physicians becoming aware of this, do you think? Uh, there's an increasing number, and I mean, the limiting factor was the fact that it was 
a complicated chemical analysis. So there were laboratories that did these tests, but they did one chemical at a time. So if you have hundreds of these environmental chemicals, uh, no one knows in advance what they should test for because people are exposed to hundreds of, potentially hundreds of different things. Right. And there's no unique symptom. Many of the symptoms like fatigue are, pro are prevalent in and many different chemicals can cause the same symptoms, so you don't know what to test. So the problem was, if you test for each one of these chemicals that is 100 to $200, and you're testing 200, well, that's $20,000 worth of testing. Right. And so the, the, uh, my goal was to introduce a, a test that could check for a large number of these tests for a decent price. Mm. So that was the goal, and, and uh, it's been wildly successful. Yeah, I'm but interested what you people, find for my sample. Yeah. <laughs> so. A lot of wine, probably. <laughs> <laughs> whatever's in a sulfa or whatever's in wine. Yeah, yeah. well, we're not, we're not checking okay. for alcohol okay. right okay. now. Okay. Although I've considered that, <laughs> I, that people might want that, or maybe some people don't want that to show right. in their test right. result. Right, <laughs> that's right. Although, but that's interesting that that was also one of the uh, the foods that contained glyphosate right. that a number of wines were found to have elevated amounts of yes. uh, glyphosate presence. So. Yes, and they're moving away from that. I was traveling in uh, Europe last summer, uh, visiting a lot of the wineries and talking to them about their pesticide use, and, mm -hmm. and they really were trying to make a concerted effort to reduce or eliminate entirely glyphosate and, uh -huh. and other chemicals. Uh -huh. uh, you know, people are becoming aware, which is a good thing. I think more so in Europe maybe than in the U.S. I'm not sure about that. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We still seem to be putting our corporate, you know, interests above our public interest. At least our regulators and lawmakers seem to be doing that. You mean the 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 government isn't their <laughs> primary focus isn't the isn't the health of the consumer? You know that it's yes. that's not their number one evidence uh, to the contrary, right? Uh -huh. Completely so. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's I mean that's one of the things in the book that I even as I was writing it, you know, I and knew this stuff, but it, when you put it together, it's really sort of alarming uh -huh. the levels of collusion and self-dealing and self-interested um, you know actions that go on between uh -huh. these companies and uh -huh. our regulators uh, you know the the regulators are supposed to be there to protect us and in many cases they're working to protect the chemical companies we mm -hmm. have a there was a great memo from 1983 or 4 from a toxicologist within the EPA who was pushing back and saying Monsanto's arguments here about safety and on this chemical are, are not acceptable. They're not mm -hmm. uh, true. And mm -hmm. they fly in the face of the evidence that mm -hmm. we're seeing in these in this research studies. Mm -hmm. And this scientist said, you know, essentially our job is to protect the public. It's not to protect mm -hmm. the chemical companies. Mm -hmm. But uh, he and others within there eventually were overruled on their views on glyphosate. And, mm -hmm because they had some real concerns, even in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. So these concerns are, are not new by mm -hmm. any means. They've yeah. just been kind of kept under the rug for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I first got interested in the chemical toxicity while working at the, the CDC, mm -hmm. and around that time, the uh, chemical that was used as an antibacterial hand soap, hexachlorophene, was mm -hmm was widely used, especially with teenagers with acne. It was a very uh, popular product, but, uh, and a matter of fact, it was, it was being put into everything. It was put into uh, mouthwash, toothpaste, feminine hygiene deodorants, uh, virtually every, every kind of thing. But then what they were finding out is that uh, uh, babies in the nursery who were washed in it were dying. Oh. And, and this is the typical thing, and I, I really remember it when I was at CDC, the discussions being about that, how we have to be very careful uh, about putting out this work. And just a hundred feet from my office, there was a pathologist who was uh, washing uh, 
uh, rats and uh, hexachlorophene and finding that there was marked uh, degeneration of the brain. Uh, some of the antibacterial right. hand soaps and, and uh, when in one of the labs I worked with, I, uh, I suspected that that was causing symptoms to the employees because in the medical lab, they're using the, right. the antibacterial hand soaps on a, on a frequent basis. So I did kind of a, just a little preliminary experiment where uh, asked people what, their, what kind of symptoms they had. And, and of course, I asked you know, how many times they washed their hands with the antibacterial hand soap. And what I found is that people would complain of uh, symptoms uh, right after they went on break. And it's because, of course, you know, you're dealing with human blood and urine and so forth. And so the first thing you, when you go on so break is to hands. wash your hands. And, and about 50% of the people would say, I, uh, I began to develop chest pains mm -hmm. or I, I was having uh, breathing difficulties or, or, uh, or I was feeling uh, depressed. So, so, so there was just a wide variety of these uh, yeah. symptoms with the uh, person who was being exposed to this. So, so it was close to 50% of people mm. were, were, uh, were having symptoms. So it was, I thought it was very uh, telling and I had written the FDA asking that they ban this and of course I never got a response yeah. back, which mm. is, it was surprising to me, but you know, the longer I'm in this field, uh, the less responsive I see our government. And I often tell people, if you're waiting for the government yeah. to protect you, you're going to be long dead before, before anything happens. Yeah, that's definitely a frustration. And my research on glyphosate in particular has made me so frustrated with FDA and USDA. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, they test annually thousands of, both agencies test thousands of food um, samples every year mm -hmm. for residues of uh, mm -hmm. pesticides mm -hmm. to keep a record, to keep a database, to track the levels and to see if there are illegally high, worrisome levels mm -hmm. um, of different chemicals, different pesticides in our foods. But they never have wanted to test glyphosate, despite mm -hmm. the fact that it's the most widely used, you know, but do you think, agrochemical. Do you think in the they world. really didn't want to test glyphosate, or there's being you know, pressure? Like, <laughs> put on them to ignore this and 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 in and, and reading your book I got the impression that the that the government agencies consider themselves cheerleaders mm -hmm. for the the chemical companies and and almost to the point that they feel like their job is to promote the use of these right. chemicals because it's beneficial to right. the economy of the United States well you definitely see aspects of that definitely which again is so alarming you see individuals within different agencies who work really hard to protect and benefit mm -hmm. these companies but then you also have you know kind of the hard working scientists and the guys who are in there who are doing their jobs and trying to wave the red flag mm -hmm. uh, you know so i can't condemn the entire agency or everybody who works there but you know the fda in particular i guess is is so frustrating because they finally did start to do some limited testing after being just hammered and criticized and, mm -hmm. for not doing this, you know, particularly after the World Health Organization mm -hmm. said it looks like this stuff causes cancer, mm -hmm. can cause cancer. Uh, so they started doing a little bit. They didn't want to talk about it. They don't want to tell the public they're doing it. They don't want to be transparent about it. They have a chemist who's been there forever, had done, worked at Syngenta, very, you know, very well-trained, esteemed, senior guy, chemist mm -hmm. who knew what he was doing, and he found it in every honey sample mm -hmm. that he gathered from around the United in States. Honey samples. Even organic honey, which yeah. is a So warming. they're spraying glyphosate on no. Uh, bees? <laughs> no, but the bees, of course, you know, bees go where bees want to go, right? Uh -huh. And uh, they go to farm fields and, mm -hmm. and flowers and parks and around and obviously pick up the glyphosate. Mm -hmm. So you might be buying organic honey, all mm -hmm. natural organic honey mm -hmm. and getting a good dose of glyphosate mm -hmm. in your honey. This mm -hmm. particular FDA chemist found 
you know, levels of glyphosate, there were many, many multiples of what's considered safe in mm -hmm. the European mm -hmm. Union. Mm -hmm. He also found glyphosate in oatmeal products, mm -hmm. baby food oatmeal mm -hmm. products. Mm -hmm. uh, but FDA hasn't uh, officially wanted to talk about any of this mm -hmm. or notify the public. Mm -hmm. or explain it or do anything to mitigate it. Mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. only reason we know this is through Freedom of Information uh, Acts and documents. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I had to sue the EPA to get several documents. Um, Congratulations. So, well, I don't know that that's something to be happy about. You know, They work for us. I think yeah. they should be turning over the documents yeah. happily. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's always a real battle. Yeah. So, you know. One lawsuit down, probably many more to come to try to get more of these documents. Um, so I guess you've seen a, a big change towards uh, helping the consumer with the new Trump administration, right? Oh, my Lord, yeah. The most worrisome, well, that's hard to say most. There's so many worrisome, but the Trump administration, as you know, I'm sure, uh, overturned a planned ban on a particularly, you know, troubling pesticide called chlorpyrifos, mm -hmm. which is uh, shepherded by Dow Chemical mm -hmm. and uh, used as an insecticide used uh, on fruits and vegetables and mm -hmm. used, you know, pretty, pretty aggressively, but has been shown to harm the brain development of mm -hmm. children, yeah. uh, you know, both before being born and shortly after. And, yeah. uh, it's a real problem and it's been banned from household use and it was to be banned from from use in food production. Dow Chemical didn't want that. Mm -hmm. Chucked out a million dollars to the Trump inaugural fund and mm -hmm. sent their lobbyists and their top people over to meet with uh, mm -hmm. the uh, new administration and mm -hmm. the ban goes away. What, what, what happened about uh, so, uh, uh, draining the swamp? Yeah. <laughs> I think it has a different it's, meaning than maybe I think a lot maybe, of us I think, thought. I think maybe what they've done is they've maybe added a few more alligators to the swamp. Yes, I don't know. I mean, the only upside, if you know, from my view, is it doesn't seem that they're trying to hide the collusion or the protection of the corporate interests necessarily. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. kind of just laying it right out there, yeah. daring anybody to to say anything to criticize it, them right? about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yes, we the, the Trump administration seems to be particularly friendly to corporate interests mm -hmm. so far. Yeah. Um, so uh, earlier you mentioned about the one of the most worrisome uh, illnesses that has been implicated as potentially caused by uh, glyphosate, and that's the uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Oh, yeah. So what are some of the statistics? I, I mean, has the incidence of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma oh, sure. uh, changed over the years? Yes. And, and uh, yeah. uh, so, uh, so when did it become a, a, a more common illness? How long ago? Oh gosh, I'd have to reread my chapter in my book, but the it it, it definitely has um, surged incidence of non-Hodgkin lymphoma uh -huh. uh, around the world, with some of the highest rates uh, increasing in North America. Uh -huh. uh, of course, now it, in just the most recent years, it seems if you track the little graphics that the uh, cancer experts put out, it seems to be leveling off a little bit. But, mm -hmm. um, but it's been very worrisome, so much so that you know regulators and uh, health experts and ha around the world have been trying to figure out why, mm -hmm. you know, what is causing this, and mm -hmm. they've looked particularly at farmers because mm -hmm. of their exposure to pesticides, mm -hmm. um, and and that's what the International Agency for Research on Cancer said. Mm -hmm. Most there's a positive link, most likely linked to non-Hodgkin lymphoma. They found sufficient evidence that glyphosate could cause cancer in laboratory animals, mm -hmm. and they found limited evidence that it could cause cancer in people, and that mm -hmm. was through the epidemiology, mm -hmm. with the most positive association to this particular cancer of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, which, as mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you know, can really manifest itself anywhere in the body, mm -hmm. and it's particularly no, I didn't deadly, know that, by the way. <laughs> deadly and awful, and uh -huh. you know, just the people I've talked to who have lost their loved ones or suffered through it themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it, that, it can be fast and deadly mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and kill really aggressively. And there are now thousands of people, about 3,000 or so, who have filed lawsuits against Monsanto, mm -hmm. uh, alleging mm -hmm. that Roundup 
is responsible for their non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So are these individual lawsuits or class action lawsuits? So they, there are both. Um, there are class action lawsuits or a actions that have multiple plaintiffs that have been filed in various state courts mm -hmm. around. It, there's a lot in Delaware and Missouri and Monsanto's hometown of St. Louis mm -hmm. uh, and, and other places. There are about 268, I think at, at last count, of cases that have been brought together mm -hmm. in federal court mm -hmm. in California. Mm -hmm. And they're being handled as something called multi-district litigation. Mm -hmm. So they're sort of moving forward together, even though they remain individual cases. Mm -hmm. um, but they're going to, the judge in that, the federal judge who's overseeing those 268 uh, lawsuits is holding what they call a Daubert hearing in December. And this will be for experts to come in and present the evidence that the plaintiff say shows glyphosate roundup causes cancer, mm -hmm. causes mm -hmm. non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Mm -hmm. So that'll be a very interesting, you know, week in December, uh, and I plan to be there. Uh -huh. This will be probably the best, you know, public display of research and evidence mm -hmm. about this chemical that we've seen because so mm -hmm. much of it has been mm -hmm. in the dark mm -hmm. uh, until now. So you know, could be very interesting. Monsa so, so in essence, this judge will decide whether this case can move forward. go move, go forward right yeah, yeah. he will decide yeah. if if they have enough to uh -huh. move forward uh -huh. uh, and monsanto of course is is asking the judge to throw it out monsanto has recently filed a motion saying they don't have the evidence they don't have the experts uh -huh. this case this all of this litigation should be thrown out mm -hmm. so we'll see <laughs> and this is this will be in California, did San you say? Francisco. Oh, okay. Yeah, court in, in San Francisco uh, in December. December. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, it'll be interesting. Yeah. yeah. So our listeners should uh, yeah uh, start, be, start uh, focusing on that the outcome. I'm sure that'll be an extremely yeah. uh, important case, regardless of which way it right. moves. Yeah, I mean, I think we all want answers. We all want just truthful information. And that's mm -hmm. sort of the point of whitewash in my reporting is that it's been very hard to get truthful and transparent information mm -hmm. because of the efforts of the chemical companies, Monsanto uh, notably, because of the regulatory sort of shroud of secrecy over mm -hmm. you know, the research and mm -hmm. the decision-making process. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, the public really doesn't have a very clear window into you know, whether or not their interests are being protected. Mm -hmm. And they should, mm -hmm. but they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're trying now to get to the bottom of it. So, yeah. So, uh, I think the public should be very appreciative of <laughs> your efforts because there are really not, not enough people who are, uh, who are going out and, and uh, giving this kind of uh, information, making it available. Yeah. Uh, to to the public. Well, as I say in the uh, introduction, it's not a feel-good story. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. but I think it's an important story. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. I've had a friend of the New York Times read it and said, oh, you know, now I don't want to eat anything in my refrigerator. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. other people say they get more outraged by every page they turn. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you want light reading and you want to feel good when you go to bed at night, that's not the book for you. <laughs> I know my my wife had uh, was talking to one of her friends, and she said, "How how can you you and your husband even enjoy life, knowing uh, uh, focusing on all these uh, different uh, uh, things that are in your food that are that are uh, causing you harm? How, you know, isn't that uh, a little too much to?" <laughs> to prevent you and from what do you say? Enjoying. What is your answer? I say, no, you're going to enjoy your life much, much better if you're healthy. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and these uh, chemicals are not uh, moving mm -hmm. you in that direction to the extent that you can do that. I know. Uh, to begin with, I'm I'm a little bit of a cheapskate, and so mm -hmm. so uh, so I I kind of resisted paying double and triple the 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 cost for organic foods, but my wife finally uh, convinced, you convinced me that that so. was the way. And, and of course, my own research yeah. uh, and, and seeing people with extremely bad health and 
with high amounts of these different chemicals uh, really convinced me. And now, of course, my testing shows I, I was uh, one of the few people tested who didn't have elevations of any of these chemicals. Yeah. I still had the chemicals, but not at the extremely yeah. high values that are associated with uh, disease. But see, because you're informed, and I guess that, as a journalist, my entire career, my entire adult life, and, and in the book, I don't think it's about trying to tell people what to do. I don't think anybody, I guess, should tell us what to yeah. eat or what not to eat yeah. or what yeah. to remember. But it's about having the information. Truthful right. and transparent, educational information, yeah. and then you can make your own mind up. You yeah. can make your own decisions and, yeah. and your your trade-offs that you're willing. Maybe, uh -huh. maybe you want to buy the organic strawberries, mm -hmm. but maybe you're not going to pay for the organic you know, steak. Or yeah. But if you're informed and you can weigh the options, it's like mm -hmm. with tobacco. If mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. it causes cancer, but you still choose to smoke, well, uh -huh. I mean, that's your right. Yeah. Don't do it around us, right? Right, <laughs> I mean, right. So I think it's just about providing people with mm -hmm. you know, accurate, factual, relevant information so they can make better choices for their mm -hmm. health and future and family. Yeah. I'm with you 100% on <laughs> It doesn't that. seem yeah. like it should be that yeah. hard. Right? <laughs> That's right. Uh, and let's see. Uh, I think uh, you've gone through them all. <laughs> I think I've gone through quite a few. Oh, I wanted to know um, what are uh, what kind of treatments are available for this non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Is it in essence a, a fatal disease? Are there any? Oh no! Do it? Do people? Do some people survive? Yes. It? Oh yes. I. I mean, I have stories of both in my book. Uh -huh. You know, people uh -huh. who have not uh -huh. uh, survived, and, and people who have. And I uh -huh. think it's like any type of cancer. It sort of depends on mm -hmm. what stage you're in when you're diagnosed, and mm -hmm. what type of treatment you pursue, and how mm -hmm. well your body responds to that treatment. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know, Jack McCall, who is sort of the lead story in my book you know it he just he went through the chemo and the radiation and the various treatments and mm -hmm. it just his body gave out and he mm -hmm. couldn't handle it and mm -hmm. he died pretty quickly and mm -hmm. pretty gruesomely um, but there's another woman Christine Shepard who you know went through and suffered as well mm -hmm. um, but she's in remission hopefully mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. you know. so uh, you know there's hope, there's there's treatment. She mm -hmm. doesn't use Roundup or Glyphosate anymore. Mm -hmm. Neither does Jack McCall's family. Mm -hmm. You know, they once once you get stricken or you know someone who's stricken, mm -hmm. you know, it's a pretty profound, life changing event, I think. Mm -hmm. So I I'd, I'd like to I I anticipate we're probably getting near the end. Ten minutes. And so I'd like to just to summarize, what what are some of the illnesses that that have been implicated as potentially uh, involved with exposure to glyphosate? We've talked about the lymphoma, right? Uh, and what are some of the other illnesses? That well, you, get? you talked about the kidney disease. Obviously, right. that's been raised. Um, and and in what other areas? I know Sri Lanka ended up banning it. But are there other countries in the world where? This kidney disease was also not that we've seen. No, uh -huh. not not to that extent. And I mm -hmm. think that that has to do with the water situation that you uh -huh. talked about. You uh -huh. know, Argentina. Uh, there have been a real concern, as I said earlier, about birth defects in yeah. children. Yeah. Uh, the way that that they're exposed there. Uh -huh. um, there are concerns in Hawaii. Uh, there's a. Re I mean, it's really sort of all over the board. There there have been research that shows um, reproductive impacts, uh -huh. potential reproductive uh -huh. problems, you know, lowered infertility, yeah. uh, that sort of thing. There was a study that came out earlier this year, 2017, uh, that associated glyphosate with fatty liver disease. Uh -huh. um, so, and of course, the, the bulk of the research that we've seen is really toxicology on, you know, lab animals. Right. And they've had issues with pancreas and mm -hmm. uh, you know the kidney and mm -hmm. uh, the, the reproductive and the male mm -hmm. rat testes and mm -hmm. I mean all sorts of tumors and all sorts of manifest manifestations mm -hmm. um, but what the best group of experts have said is that the most real-life human condition linkage is to non-Hodgkin lymphoma mm -hmm. there's some concerns about multiple myeloma mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. 
but the science is still, you know, as you know, as a scientist, you don't have one study and say that's it. You know, correct, <laughs> it's, correct. It's a body of work and a body yes. of evidence yeah. with people yeah. uh, working over time to try to come to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. So, the red flags are waving. Yeah, we don't. I don't know that we have the final answers yet. Mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. So, um, Great Plains Laboratory has a, a test for glyphosate in in urine, and I wasn't sure what we were going to find, but I was very surprised that. Uh, so, for example, uh, triplets with very high mm -hmm. values of glyphosate in the urine values that were. 20 times the, uh, the average mm -hmm. person's, uh, two of the triplets had autism, the other a suspected uh, seizure disorder, yeah. and the, the main reason they were getting it because they were eating uh, the genetically modified corn in the form of tortillas. They were Hispanic mm -hmm. origin, mm -hmm. and Hispanic people love tortillas, okay. and the, the fresher the better. Yeah. And unfortunately in the United States, almost all the corn now is Genetic. glyphosate exposed, right. and so they had extremely high values, and once they uh, took out the, the GMO tortillas, and uh, they, they had a plummeting of the... Really? Of the amount of glyphosate in the urine after only six weeks, and and uh, and with one of the children with autism having a significant improvement of symptoms, mm. and and what I found is that it was uh, associated with two different types of abnormalities, which was uh, affecting the function of the mitochondria, which right. produced the energy in the body, and the other thing is that glyphosate kills, just like it kills weeds, it kills beneficial bacteria like lactobacilli that are present in, in yogurt. Earth. And on the other hand, it doesn't kill some of the most harmful bacteria like salmonella and clostridia. And that this is becoming a, a major problem that clostridia bacteria, many of which have terrible, um, cause terrible illnesses like tetanus and mm -hmm. botulism, that some of these bacteria are found in the intestines of farm animals, that even there's a question about if some farmers have developed these because they're the types of bacteria in the field or have the beneficial bacteria are disappearing from the field replaced by, yeah. by more pathogenic bacteria. And these children with autism had very high values. Since then, I found that it's not limited to children. We think found adults, adults who were, were eating organic, but they were chewing tobacco, which mm -hmm. was not organic and had extremely high amounts of glyphosate right. with symptoms of uh, depression and fatigue uh, that individuals with uh, a wide variety of illnesses. And I found other cases of children with, uh, with uh, autism with high amounts of glyphosate sometimes combined with other chemicals, uh, other agricultural chemicals it's as well. It's pervasive. It's yeah. everywhere. It's used, as you said, in tobacco. It's also yeah. used in tea production, yeah. which I didn't know. You know your little tea that you yeah. brew and drink in the morning. But. And I think your book indicated there was about a hundred different agricultural products that are now That the EPA con lists contaminated. As, yeah, as uh, being, being sprayed or treated, you know. Yeah with glyphosate in, in conjunction with the production. So, uh -huh. yeah, it's definitely not just, you know, corn and soybeans. Uh, right. <laughs> it's pretty widespread right. out there. And you mentioned, you know, there was um, the the children and the triplets. There There is an alarming but still sort of new um, base of information. There's some researchers out of Indiana that are tracking pregnant women and glyphosate residues. Mm -hmm. And they have found, just in very early research, not peer-reviewed, I should say, you know, adverse birth outcomes mm -hmm. correlated with levels mm -hmm. of glyphosate mm -hmm. in the women's urine. So, as I said, there seems to be a lot of red flags, you know, mm -hmm. that need to be tracked down and yeah. pursued and investigated, right? Well, uh, Karen, thank you very thank much you. for uh, coming today, and I uh, just want to a reminder of the uh, the book.
It's called Whitewash, the story of a weed killer, cancer, and the corruption, corruption of, science. of science. So I think all of you uh, who enjoy a good read will greatly uh, in, enjoy this book. Thank you.